Before we begin, a quick disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment and information purposes only. It should not be relied upon as a base for any investment decision. Nothing here is a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any security. Either the host, guests, or clients of either may own securities discussed on this podcast. Record. Before we begin, a quick and disclaimer. Welcome this to another podcast is for entertainment the, and information purposes um, only. It should not cost. be relied upon uh, as a base for any investment decision. A very special guest, or an offer to Xavier buy or sell any security. Uh, either the host, guests, or right clients of either may own securities uh, discussed Xavier, on this welcome. podcast. Thank you very much, Ram, for having me here. Yeah, no, it's uh, my uh, my honor. And um, could you maybe um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at uh, Brightgate Capital? Uh, because I understand you have like multiple um, functions and um, uh, what what got you into investing? Yes, well, uh, Braget Capital is, is an asset management boutique based in, in Spain. Uh, we are based in Madrid, right? I've been working here for five years uh, and last year we launched uh, an, a, a balanced fund, uh, equity and high yield, right? Which is called a uh, Braget Focus. Right. Uh, before that, I was I I I've been working in Brightgate as a as a fixed income analyst. Uh, it has been four challenging years, to say the least. Um, uh, and before that, I was I was finishing my PhD uh, in London. I did a PhD in economics, uh, financial microeconomics, to be to be more precise. And then I decided that that asset management made a lot of sense because you have to read a lot and. Um, to speak uh, very little, I would say, and, and I think that, that that made a lot of sense uh, to me. Okay, so I like to read a lot. And um, you, do you still uh, analyze for high yield as well, or you're now completely over to the? Yes, we have a very a very broad mandate. Okay, mm-hmm. so we can invest across asset classes. Uh, so when we start looking at a company, uh, uh, we start from scratch. I would say so we can we can take a position in, in the equity of the company in the high yield convertibles prefer and so on and so forth so so we don't have any specific target for for an equity allocation let's say so we are it's, it's just based bottom up right so so if we decide that the high yield uh, bond of, of that company makes sense then we will lo- we will go uh, for the debt of that company rather than the equity okay so for instance our exposure to the uh, uh, thermal coal space in the U.S., uh, which is done through, through uh, two coal producers, Alliance and Console, right? Uh, we, we did it through the bonds of these companies because we, we thought the risk reward proposition was much was much better, and the and the and the yield towards of these bonds were uh, was generous enough to 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 invest in this in this instrument. Oh, that sounds interesting already. Um... Were they trading at like below par as well? Because you think that's common in that space, or just high yes, yield? Uh, yes, yes. Some, some some years ago, I mean, when when, when you had the twenty seventeen and twenty eighteen coal cycle, it, it was a very short cycle, and it was mainly driven by by the by the closures in the Chinese space, right? I mean, these these companies were fortunate enough to to to, to issue new debt, okay. And this debt until 2019, more or less, is if I remember correctly, this this debt was trading uh, even well above par. I remember console bonds. I remember these bonds were trading at some point at 110, right? And then over the last couple of years, even even before the corona crisis, right, uh, both bonds have been trading lower and lower. And at some point, for instance, in the case of console, they have reached uh, uh, 45. So so I. We think it's a it's a it's a very nice proposition. You you are creating the company at the, at, at a very low EV. Well, so uh, if they don't go uh, completely out of business, uh, it's interesting space. Yes, uh, I, I I I think it's a tough call, right? Because all all of us uh, know that 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 coal is in secular decline, so no question about that. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, there has been some overreaction in the sense that 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 uh, people think that legislation, regulation, and, and politics influence a lot of the coal space. And I think most of this influence has, has have come from gas. So, so all, all the negative impact that we have seen on the coal space over the last four or five years, it's because natural gas prices uh, have been very low. And, and to some extent, we, we expect them 
to be quite low in the future. I mean, uh, one one of the lessons of, of the last few years is that there is there is a lot of gas, right? And there is a lot of cheap gas. Sure, yeah. I think uh, some came uh, offline when um, uh, there was such a glut of oil in uh, the beginning of the pandemic, maybe March. Uh, maybe that helped a little bit. Um, but um, yeah, there's a lot of gas, gas and, uh, and more to come. Um, let's see. Hey, I've looked at the companies you're investing in and um, uh, yeah, I, I really liked your portfolio so much. It's, it's very unusual for me that I think, oh, I could have bought that one. Oh, I could have bought that one. And I mean, like that the general thesis attracts me because it, of course I don't know them all in a very detailed level. Um, it's, I'm curious, like, what is your general philosophy or how do you um, uh, go to those uh, companies that you're investing in? Yes, well, I, I, I would say it's a three-branch approach. Uh, most of these points uh, are not novel at all, I would say. And the last one, maybe this. So, well, the, the first one is concentration. Uh, um, most, probably most of your speakers are very concentrated managers. You know that in Europe, because we, we have to follow usage rules, uh, I mean, you, you, you can have a hedge fund, right? But, but most of us, because of uh, commercial reasons, we have to do our strategies in, in a usage format. So that, that constrains us a little bit in terms of how, how far, in terms of, cons of concentration, we, we want you, to go, right? You have so, to have a number of positions, maybe. Uh, I don't exactly, actually know I mean, the number. Your, your top position cannot, cannot go higher than 10%. Uh, your number of positions, uh, more than 5%, cannot go higher than 40% and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. So it means that, that sometimes, uh, as we will speak in a while, for instance, in, in the case of our memory makers, maybe I cannot get a position of higher than 10% in Samsung, but I can diversify that position in Hynix and Micron, which are basically the same, I would say, right? So, oh, right. so, so that's 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 the first point that it's it's as concentrated as we can, okay. So, and, and we want to to be for for the long haul, right? Uh, the second point I would say that we look for companies with no debt, and what when I mean no debt is no debt is is not like okay for this sector three times EBITDA is okay, right? Okay. No, when I mean no debt is no debt. Okay, I I have the theory that most, uh, even the algorithms, right? And, and many analysts, when they do a screenings, they do it in an unleveraged basis, in the sense that they take the total assets of the company, the total equity of the company, right? And they, they look at the net profit, and then they do a kind of return on equity, right? When, when you have unlevered companies with a ton of cash, uh, of course that cash uh, is, is, is a burden for your returns, right? And, and they don't score very well. Sometimes most of these companies, for some reason, they, they become more generous with the shareholders or, or they distribute a special dividend or, or whatever, and they suddenly they screen much better, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so you have many examples of that. I mean, even, even, in, even in very big companies like Apple in 2016, I mean, you could, you could say that, of course, that Apple uh, has, has all, there has been a lot of debate about Apple, right? And in 2016, it was a bit murkier, but I think, the principal reason why Apple was so cheap is because the the, the large cash uh, in, in its balance sheet. Curiously yeah. enough, Apple has been distributing cash. So you could say that now, I mean, it has still a, a ton of cash, right? But but in terms of valuation and in terms of this reward, you could say that Apple is, is a less attractive investment than, than it was in 2016, right? But I think they got a lot of pressure from uh, ICANN, I think, uh, at that time, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Just so for for cash. So, for instance, Samsung, I think it's it's having the same problem, right? It doesn't screen very well when when you do very basic numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but but you know that the cash in the balance sheet of Samsung is a strategic decision, and, and that could change uh, rapidly. I would say, right? So, so that that's our second point of that, right? Um, and the third one is that uh, when, when we approach companies, uh, we normally value companies in a, in a different way, okay? We, we never use free cash flows, okay? We never use dividends, and we rarely use, uh, and I can now uh, elaborate on this, 
and we rarely use multiples, okay? So the way we value companies is through the residual income model, which says that you basically have your uh, assets in your balance sheet, right? And then you have to bring forward in time, right, your uh, future economic earnings. Economic earnings are those earnings that, that, that are earned about the cost of capital, okay? So if you have, let's say, a cost of capital of 10% and your ROEs are 10%, right? Then your your investment is basically book value, right? Mm -hmm. This this evaluation approach is 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 very common in financials. I mean, when when you look at the at the banks, right? Uh, many people say, I mean, what's your uh, return on equity, and what's your rate of discount, and what's and what's then your pri your price to book value, right? And and and, and that's all. Mm -hmm. But but for some reason uh, it's it's not applied to to the rest of the of the of, of the companies right in 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 theoretical terms I mean when 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 you do the math right the residual income model and the free cash flow model are exactly the same right so it, it's it's basically the same so if, if you had in an ideal world uh, all the parameters to conduct your valuation okay uh, and uh, they were given right you would obtain exactly the same number for your valuation, right? But as you know, as, as Jogi Berra said, uh, in practice and in theory, things are different and blah, 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 blah right? Yeah. The problem, the problem in practice, right, is that uh, the free cash flow model uh, faces very hard, uh, face, faces many hurdles that the residual income model doesn't have to, right? For instance, Imagine a company that is investing too much, like, like the semiconductor companies, like TSMC, Samsung, uh, Intel, Micron, right? Uh, most, most of the time, they don't generate any free cash flow, right? So how do you evaluate these companies? So you, you have to make this fiction that you are projecting free cash flows up to 2022, 2023, four, and so forth, right? But of course, that, that's a bit of a challenge because it means that, that you are projecting very far in time, right? So there is some degree of uncertainty. But yeah, if something, if you got something wrong, it's, you know, it's completely, your valuation is completely off. Exactly. With the residual income model, on, on the other hand, you are already giving some, uh, some, some value to those investments. So if Micron is making uh, big investments, okay, and they don't generate free cash flow, but they are generating economic profit, then uh, the residual income model tells you, well, you, you should bring this, this value onto your balance sheet, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's valuable, right? Those investments uh, are, are worthwhile. I, I, I would recommend to your, uh, to your listeners, if they are interested in a very, in a very technical uh, reading of this approach, uh, to read uh, Stephen Penman, which is, a, which is a professor at uh, Columbia University, okay? He has written a couple of books. Uh, one of them is Accounting for Value, which is a, is a small book. And I would say it's, it's by far the, the best uh, book on value investing I've ever read. Uh, and I can tell you I've, I've read uh, quite a few. Uh, so it's, it's a great book. Uh, and the other one is a, is a textbook, which is called Financial Statement and Security Evaluation, right? Uh, by Stephen Penman as well, which, which you go into more detail uh, uh, more detail of, the, of this method, right? So, and this is how we do things, right? So we, when, when we approach companies, uh, we try to, to understand the, the historical uh, performance, mm -hmm. okay? So that means we go 10 years in time, roughly, sometimes less, sometimes more, right? And that implies, of course, that our companies most of the time have to be mid-cap, large-cap, because in that sense, you have a, a long historical track record. For us, the long historical track record is something that we can anchor on because it's it's public information, it's cheap to obtain, right? And it gives you a lot of clues, right? So it, it, it's, it's, it's basically the result of hundreds, thousands of decisions over the last decade. So it's, it's, it's a lot of value information. So, so when we have that and we clean the numbers, okay? And, and we look at the numbers uh, from, from this lens, right? Then we can we can assess whether this return on the assets, uh, return on net operating assets, right, um, is sustainable or not. Uh, cool. Um, I actually haven't read the, the books that you recommended. 
Um, so I'm definitely going to check them out. Uh, Columbia University is uh, the, the University of the Value Investor. <laughs> so um, super interesting. Um, maybe to uh, stay a little bit at a high level before we dive into uh, real companies, which is which I always uh, love the most. Um, how are you looking at uh, the economy right now? Because we're kind of in a weird spot. Uh, markets are doing, well, great. And the economy doesn't feel that way. Uh, what are your, th your thoughts? Uh, it's, 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 it, has been, it has been a very challenging period because I, I say that the divergence uh, between the fundamentals of the companies and the valuations are, are, are is, is higher than ever, right? I mean, uh, we have never we have never seen such a time when when you have businesses. Uh, I mean, probably just for one year or a couple of years, right? Not 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 forever, right? But with 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 a, a decline, a very profound decline in earnings, right? And valuations going higher and higher, right? I think one of the one of the reasons, which is which is very little acknowledged, is that the uh, the unequal income distribution makes to be valuation so high, right? Uh, I mean, probably many of many of many of your listeners will be thinking that, of course, central banks are are, are the main culprit be behind it, and I wouldn't disagree. Uh, but but I would say to 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 these people, right? That I mean, we have had low interest rates before, for instance, in Japan, for 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 more than three decades now, right? For for for, for a little bit less than three decades, and in Europe, oh, no, yes, for over the last decade, right? And valuations in Europe until very recently, and Japan until very until very recently again have been very low, right? So so central banks are not the only recipe, right? To 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 high valuations, right? And I think that the Corona crisis, this uh, K-shaped recovery that, that we are hearing in the news, is making uh, the income distribution even worse. Right? When you have very unequal income, income distribution, it means that consumption levels are low because high high income earners cannot cannot spend all all the so the, the, their marginal propensity to consume is very low, right? And they have to park these 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 savings in some kind, of, some kind of asset, right? And, yeah. and that's coupled with a very low uh, real investment environment, right? Uh, nobody invests uh, anything uh, right now in, 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 the, in the Western world. China is, is a different story, we know. And I think that, that has created that there, there, are, there is a, a ton of savings out there looking for vehicles to invest and, and, and that's why valuations are, are very stretched. You could argue that whether this is going to be something secular uh, for the next decade, I, I, I couldn't tell you because that, that's basically a, a political decision, whether this uh, uh, wealth uh, inequality is sustainable or not. But I, I certainly think that that is one of the main drivers of stock valuations right now. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's a, a you know, great point that you make that um, uh, Europe and Japan didn't have those high valu valuations and still don't really have those. Um, it kind of destroys that point that low interest rates need to result in high stock prices, unless you know all the uh, Japanese and Europeans are investing in the U.S., which to an extent is uh, probably the case. But You're uh, very right. yeah, it's uh, it's a strange strange world. Um, and what are your thoughts on um, inflation? Could that um, maybe um, force like uh, politics a little bit that, um, or um, uh, solve some of the in inequality? I, 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 I don't see any inflation in, in the short term. I mean, I, I don't make investment decisions uh, based on inflation. So the, the stocks we are going to talk about, they don't have any, any inflation uh, outlook baked in, right? Yeah. But but my my views on inflation are much stronger than than in any other macroeconomic topic. I mean, we we at this stage, uh, the amount of evidence that inflation is basically caused by by wages, right, and not by uh, monetary policy decisions, I think is overwhelming. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have had an un an unprecedented easing in monetary conditions. 
not just in the US, right, but, but worldwide. And, and I would say, again, look at uh, Europe and Japan, right, over the last uh, two, three decades, right, with, with unlimited quantities of QE, and there is no inflation in the horizon, right? And, and because there is no inflation in the horizon, it's because wages are low and because the levels of debt in the system are, are, are very high, right? I recommend your, your listeners to, to, to look at the, I mean, the theories of uh, Hyman Minsky and, and even Fisher, which is called, and, and, and Richard Koo, which, which is a very prominent economist, right? And with, with, with a lot of very nice books. All of them basically argue that uh, deflations occur because you have a very high level of debt in your system, right? And, and, and all of your actors in the system are trying to repay that debt and that creates a further spiral, right? Which if, if, if you don't have enough fiscal policy, then, then you cannot get out of it, right? So I'm, 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 a, I'm an advocate, uh, very much so of, of the debt deflation theory, because I think that it theoretically it makes a lot of sense. And also from a, from a practical perspective of what's going on in the world, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense as well. Okay. Uh, well, with that, let's uh, dive into some real uh, companies. Um, one that um, I think is really interesting position you have on is uh, uh, Lukoil. And um, I did an analysis of a large oil company. So it's a, it's a while back, but uh, it was like by far the cheapest on a price per barrel basis. Or maybe it was a different Russian one, but it was definitely uh, uh, either Lukoil or a uh, a Russian peer. Um, why do you like it so much? And um, yeah, what, what got you into uh, Luca? Well, I, I know you are an expert in the energy space, Bram. So, so probably we, we, we can talk a lot about it. But but if if you look at the energy space and, and you are looking for a for quality oil exposure, right? Mm -hmm. As I said, I, I think there is a ton of gas. And I think gas is a structurally a disadvantaged uh, sector uh, and full stop, right? Uh, maybe gas will go four, five, six dollars. I don't know in, in the short term, but I would say that over the long term is uh, the outlook is not very promising, right? Oil is different, okay? Because as, as you know, uh, oil is very difficult to get, right? So I, I wanted to get in the energy space uh, as much as an oil exposure as, as I could. And mm -hmm no gas exposure. So, so that's, that's the first thing, right? The, the second thing is that it's very difficult. Um, it's, I mean, it's extremely difficult to find a high quality good assets in the, in the oil space. First of all, because, because most of these assets are, are held by, by, by government companies, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and second, uh, because most of these assets are held by the mayors, uh, but the problem uh, you have uh, with the mayors is twofold, right? Uh, first of all, uh, now they have a ton of, of other assets, which are basically renewable assets, right? And, and I think it's, it's not the right time to invest in these assets. I mean, probably we will have a green economy, but when all of these guys with no pre uh, previous expertise are, are, are investing in the same space at the same time, we know that probably forward returns are going to be are going to be bad, right? Uh, you, you're referring to like this. There's a huge European trend, I would say, uh, which is for like the Shell and um, I think the French one. Is uh, I'm, I'm talking about Total, BP, Shell, yeah. Equinor, right? Or any uh, and even Repsol, the the, the, the the Spanish company. All of these yeah. guys, right? So all course, buying they, like they, wind farms and solar farms uh, or building exactly. them. Yeah, and then uh, they're investing quite a lot in it. At first, it wasn't that much, but now it's a lot. And uh, at Shell, even compensation is tied to it now. And um, I think it's in part regulatory driven. There are some strange European regulations that, that drives it. But yeah, yeah, just to clarify for the listeners, but please, uh, you, I can understand you. My, you know, you question how. Um, how great are the returns on that investment going to be? I, I get. I, I, I'm not an expert in renewables, so I, I mm -hmm. cannot say. But but the ingredients. I mean, when when you look at the general picture, right, that doesn't that doesn't look very promising. When when all of these guys are doing the same thing, right? Yeah. It, it looks it looks like the oil sector in 2013, right? Everyone investing in 
in ultra deep water paying seven hundred thousand dollars per day. <laughs> In, yeah, it feels like a really crowded, crowded trade. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, exactly. And they, and they don't have any expertise. And full stop. They, they, they will probably develop it. I'm, 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 I'm sure because they have a lot of resources. But, but anyway, even if you think renewables are, are, are going to be a great thing and the investment is going to be a great thing, if you want to invest in oil because you have some, some, some view on oil, whatever, right? Then you want you want to have exposure to oil, right? Not to renewables. So you, you, you want to have a pure play. So, so, sure. so that means that basically the shells of this world, uh, Total, any BP are basically out of the picture. Yeah. Well, the second reason is that they have tons of gas as well. Uh, Shell and BP, they have, uh, they have been investing in, in gas assets over, over, over the last five years enormously, right? Um, and I, and I don't want it's it's liquefied gas, right? So it's it's a bit it's a bit different than 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 pure gas, right? But but anyway, uh, it, it, uh, maybe to um, you know be the advocate of the advocate of the devil here. Um, like I understand that like great oil assets are probably a lot more um, unique or uh, harder to get these days. But some people say like you know. Um, usage of oil is going to decrease um, and while for gas maybe there's a little bit of a future because it's so flexible and it can be used uh, next to renewables uh, do you think uh, that advantage is outweighed by the um, by that so abundant yes I, I, I certainly think so that, that's that's a very nice summary okay that's um... <laughs> too bad so, so that's that's one problem as, as, as I was saying and, and then you have players like Exxon and Chevron right yeah uh, which they have been more steadfast in the in the oil investment the problem with with Exxon is that uh, they are still committed to invest in shale and shale assets are, are horrible I mean it's okay. it's no question about it uh, uh, they, they they haven't been able uh, Exxon is very straightforward about it they uh, uh, just, just to let you know, I mean, when, when, when you look at their annual reports, the amount of information per segment they, they provide, and in terms of the return on capital of, of every business, is phenomenal. Uh, so, it's, so it's a bit of uh, a mismatch of what Exxon says in the annual reports. Uh, they are comparing Guyana versus the shale, right? Which they are very total, total, totally different assets. The offshore assets much better. And when you look at the return on capital, that has been the story, right? But then they are still committed to invest in shale, which for me is, is a bit strange, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, Exxon has uh, premier assets. Uh, the refining system, uh, Exxon's refining system is phenomenal. It's, it's unparalleled, right? But, of course, you have the capital allocation decisions, which have, have not been very good. Then you have the Canadian players, okay? Mm -hmm. And the Canadian players have been good guys, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is that the assets are not so good. Uh, they are much better than shale, of course, but but oil sands need need high oil prices, right? And and when you look at the at the returns of, over the last decade of players like Suncor and, and Imperial Oil, I mean Suncor, you have a full you have a full cycle, right? With with oil prices at 120 and, and oil prices at 40, and Suncor on average has has obtained a return capital of of nine percent, right? Imperial oil a bit better, uh, 11% because Imperial oil has has had a has had more more downstream exposure. Uh, the refining system of Imperial has been bigger in relative terms than than Suncor. So um, and because refining has been a very good business over the last decade, Imperial has been a better investment over the last decade than Suncor, of course. But of course, they, they are not they are well managed businesses, but they are not uh, top notch assets. I, I would say right. And then you have Luke Oil. Right, uh, uh, Luke Oil. Uh, the first advantage of Luke Oil is that doesn't have any debt. I, I mm -hmm. mean, it's it's minimal, right? It it has been it has increased a little bit over over the last nine months because of COVID, right? But when I mean zero is zero, so Luke Oil doesn't have any debt. The capital allocation policy has been phenomenal. I mean, when you look at 2019 and and you take uh, current Luke Oil prices and you assume that the dividend and the shareholder and the sorry and the and the share buybacks 
are going to be at the 2019 levels, probably in 2022, 2023. Then you get a, a yield of 14%. Which, which I think they are paying everything out of the business. Just, they are just making a, a maintenance capes, right? And then, and then the assets, the assets are conventional. Uh, well, Lukoil has, has recently been moving to, towards tight oil, a little bit of it and, and, and a bit of shale, which uh, the shale in Russia is, is, is a bit better than, than in the US because of the royalties and, 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 and other considerations as well. So Blue Coil has, has better assets with low, low decline rates, okay? Um, the, 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 the number of, of years of 1P uh, reserves is 18 years. So you have, you have a, 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 a... That's almost double the number of reserve years that a lot of majors have, I think, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. That's a lot. And you have to take into account that, that this... Uh, uh, assessment was done with very low oil prices. So basically, if for, for all practical purposes, look oil reserves are infinite. I mean, in the sense that it's probably 25, 30 years and who cares, right? right. Um, the, Do you the, mean like in the same sense that like all um, reserves of um, oil companies are a bit understated in that um, if prices rise, you know, they would count a lot more um, exactly. barrels? Okay, sure. But then exactly. If you have a huge uh, reserve base, then that adjustment is also going to be huge. Okay, so they they, they produce 2.3 million barrels of oil uh, equivalent. Most of it is oil, more than 75 percent, which is a nice which is a nice mix, right? And then they also have 1.5 million barrels in refining capacity. Luke oil's refining capacity is is very good for Russian standards and for European standards but not for US standards. So, so when you compare Luke Oil's refining footprint against Suncor or Imperial or Exxon, it's, it's, it's subpar. But, but because it's mostly a regional business, it's, 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 it's also nice. And if, you, if you're a great refiner, you can mix like more complicated fuels and that usually you get a better price. You can be more flexible. If one fuel gets a high price, you can make that. And, Exactly, you have you have more uh, flexibility with with the differentials, right? But it also means that if the differentials are very low, right, it means that the original capex you put into the refinery it, it's not going to pay off because so it's it's, it's a difficult decision to make. Uh, overall, I would say that Luke Oil's uh, refining business has has been quite good, right? And for yeah. me, it's very important to find an, an oil company, right, mm -hmm. that 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 has uh, both businesses, right? Uh, in these cases, one plus one is not two, it's more than two, right? I mean, I, I've seen so many good businesses, uh, many of them in the North Sea, just with upstream exposure. When, when oil prices go, go down, then they are in trouble. If they had a refining business, then mm. they could, uh, to, some, to, to some extent, right, to, to stabilize the, the, the upstream business, and that's, that's really valuable. Right, so so many many. I mean, when you look at Sankor and Imperial Oil, that has been the story over the last five years, right? Okay. Uh, the reason why they've been able to generate at least some some cash flow, right? So so you don't have that problem. The the problem with Corona, of course, it, 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 it's been a double warming, right? Uh, your upstream sector is going to be impacted, but also your downstream because you are not operating at at at, at optimal capacity rates. Utilization rates, sorry. So, and and and, and finally, uh, Luke Oil. When when you look at, at at the last day over the last decade, they have been obtaining a, a 13% return on net operating assets and lever. Okay, and it has been very stable because because the tax system in Russia encourages that kind of stability. Okay, okay. so so it it has been 13% higher than the Canadian players, a little bit uh, less than Exxon, right? But much yeah. more stable. Um, and the nice thing about it with no debt is that Luke Oil right now is trading at 0.7 times uh, net operating assets. Okay, so if you think that uh, they are going to obtain uh, in the future a 13% still return on net operating assets, they should be trading at, at around something like 1.3, 1.4. So it's, it's a double from current levels, right? Of course, I, I don't have any expectation that Luke Oil probably will ever trade higher than one times EBNOA. Right. Uh, when you look at history, Luke Oil has always traded at a discount, right? Mm 
Yeah. And, and I expect that that's going to be the case. I, I don't expect in Miracle. Uh, and, and that's why it's the, 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 the shareholder, the capital allocation policy, right? It's very important because if the, if the stock doesn't revaluate with capital gains, at least you have a very high dividend yield and then this is what, what you are getting. So I expect on average that if, if, if oil prices go, go back to 50, 55, we, we, don't, need, we don't need more, right? They, they, they generate good, good, good returns with, with 55, right? Because at 55, they, they have to pay very low Russian taxes, right? I think this, this is probably a 16% and level return going forward. Okay, so um, if I can summarize a little bit, you, this is very safe because there's no debt. Um, it uh, actually generates good returns on the capital that it invests. Um, it doesn't trade at a, it trades at a low multiple. Um, and it always has, but you, you're not counting on that improving. Uh, are you getting some money like out of it through dividend or, um, and so maybe a, a second follow up on why I'm asking, um, you, you know, you're aware of the geopolitical risk. That's why they traded a lower valuation, lower discount. Um, and so you're fairly confident that it's not going to deteriorate much. Um, like that you're, you, you know, you get your assets seized or something like that. So that's, I'm interested in your uh, view on that. Well, I, I to, to, to be honest, I, I, I don't have very a very good answer about it. Uh, I mean, um, Luke Oil, a major shareholder, it has been a major shareholder for very long. Mm -hmm. Okay, it has been a it has been an oligarch, I would say, um, with with obviously very good connections to to Putin because it, it cannot be otherwise, right? It is. I mean, that is uh, the case with a lot of uh, larger uh, Russian exactly. companies. Yeah. He was he was a very uh, he was a very uh, very important figure in the in the communist transition because he was previously the the Ministry of Energy and he was uh, he was the one who brought to Russia the idea that that you you must have oil mayors with integrated operations. I mean, we 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 must have Exxon's and Chevron's of the world in order to compete with the, with the Western expertise, okay? O over the years, the Russian industry has, has developed its own expertise. So most of the contractors uh, of Luke Oil are Russian players. So they, it, it, it gives them a, a bit of leverage in terms of, of pricing, of course. Uh, but, but it also gives them the flexibility not to rely on Schlumberger or Halliburton or, or any of these guys in case deteriorations, like, 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 like it happened in Venezuela, right? That, that you have, and then Halliburton has, has, has to go out of the country and then you don't have any expertise, okay, to, to develop your fields. That's not going right. to happen uh, to Luke Oil, right? Um, and, 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 and the second thing I told you, uh, which is very important for, for Luke Oil and, and, and actually I forgot to mention, is that uh, it's a dollar business, right? Because it sells, uh, it sells barrels of oil, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a dollar market. Yeah, but more than fifty percent. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm talking out of my mind, so I'm, I'm by heart. Sure. I mean, so so I think more than fifty percent of its costs are in rubles, right? So it means that when there is a geopolitical tension or or where oil prices go down, uh, mm -hmm. the ruble depreciates, and that's very good news for Luke Oil, and 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 that's the other reason why the returns have been so stable. You have very nice operations with a management that has been fairly reasonable, I would say, allocating capital. On top of that, you have the Russian tax system, which caps your upside, but also your downside. And on top of that, you have the ruble, right? Which it's, it's I think it's, it's game changing. Cool, so this, uh, that, that gives it a very stable earning stream. And um, that, that's so interesting because energy is very pro-cyclical. And then, uh, yeah, that's, it's cool. And um, to some, as, as you know, you have the same thing to some extent with the Canadian players, right? That. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Well, I haven't lo ever looked at that, but I uh, mm -hmm. should check that out probably. Um, let's see, maybe. And what, are you, what, what are your thoughts on like the oil price or you're just assuming if it's you know, if it stays like this, that's okay, but it probably gets to 55 or, um, well, yeah, what are, you, what are your views and what time frames are you thinking about? 
Well, it's, it's, it's very difficult because, it, uh, I mean, the, the oil story over the last decade, it has been a story of supply, right? Mm -hmm. is that at some point, we didn't have enough supply, and then later, we had more than enough supply, right? That's uh, a lot of shale, like the, the shale is coming on so, uh, so exactly. quickly, and uh, they turn it down, and then it's back up, and uh, like that. And there's no more, like, big upswings. Exactly. And then you have the Canadians, of course, ramping up production over the decade, which is a very stable and a sticky production. Uh, so, so, but, but now it's, it's a demand situation. And, 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 and here, uh, when you look at fundamentals, it's, it's, it's much harder to say, right? Because when you look at supply, I mean, all, every, oil, every oil bull has been wrong, right? That they have been looking to this kind of, I mean, a, a, a Haber models, right? Saying, okay, this is going to be the, the, the decline of oil per year. And, and they were right, right? But they didn't take into account technological, technological advances. The problem with demand, of course, it depends on a lot of things. And it, it's not so deterministic, I would say. I, I would think that by the end of, a, of next year, right? A, we should have much more clarity, right? To see whether vaccines have worked or not. Okay, to see the scares of the of the economic depression. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the 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 the, the, the real effects. I mean, the, the, there are a lot of things still to 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 analyze earlier, and that's the reason I invested in Luke oil because when when you when you have a balance sheet, right, then you can uh, you can afford the luxury of of waiting for the recovery, right? You are sitting on a very nice yield. Uh, and just that, I mean, I've been following the oil market for the last four years, and very in depth, I would say. So I don't, I don't, I don't spend uh, any longer more time in in predicting whether the the oil market is going to be in balance next quarter or two quarters. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I, I I don't know. So, I, yeah, I, you you get survival out of the great balance sheets that you pick. Exactly. And then um, you have the patient, yeah, or the patient of the ability to wait for uh, when the price spikes come. And uh, unfortunately, for oil investors, that's even longer than uh, um, we would have expected like five years ago. Um, and then I, I noticed you made uh, quite a few energy investments in the crash of 2020. And um, you, you were uh, like very forthright about uh, that you regretted some of your moves. And uh, can you tell us about um, about those? Because it was super interesting uh, to learn from uh, each other's mistakes uh, or failed investments. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, one mistake was California resources. Uh, what's probably you 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 are very aware of it because it's 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 trending topic always in seeking alpha this this company. Oh, okay. right? I actually didn't know it uh, well. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's CRC. It, it's it's a conventional producer based in California, right? Uh, uh, it was a span off in 2014, I think, right? With a uh, from from Occidental, uh, with a ton of debt, and of course they 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 were very lucky, right? I mean, when when you are a span off in 2014, and and, and then you have the oil uh, down cycle, and you you cannot do anything. It's it's impossible, right? The, their assets are okay. Uh, they are not. Uh, they are not top notch, but they, they, I would say they are. They are better than shale, right? So, so in a in a sixty five seventy dollars environment, they could make it. Okay, the the, the 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 management team was promising that they were going to sell assets. They they they, they had some non core assets, real estate, some uh, midstream assets that they. I, I guess they they could have uh, fetched a nice valuation for them, right? Mm -hmm. And I still retain the core the core operations. But I mean year after year after year, I mean we 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 arrived to twenty twenty, they are still high level, right? The bonds collapsed and, and at that point we, we bought uh, CRC bonds at thirty five cents on the dollar, the second links, right? Uh, because at that point as well they they offer a, a restructuring of the red, saying that basically I mean if you have second links then you could convert those second liens to, to a royalty asset uh, on L Hills, which uh, is CRC major asset, right? 
which which we 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 very much like it because we thought I mean a royalty I mean El Hills is 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 going to keep producing for for decades, right? Yeah, I and love I, royalties. Exactly, we are we are we are the top of the stack of the capital structure. Okay, and on top of that, I think the yield was the coupon was nine percent, something like that, right? But because you were buying the second liens at a discount, I mean, it works something like a 15% deal, which we thought was reasonable, right? So we decided to buy some, some second lien bonds. Uh, then you, you had the, the Corona crash and the, and the, and the OPEC, right? Uh, lack of agreement, uh, the crude collapse, and, and the company decided to retire the, their offer, right? So we, we basically had now a second lien bond that that in theory in a normal environment i i would say it's it was worth uh, quite a bit but but not at that point in time so, oh, yeah. so, so it was basically a, a write-off cool so there was like a special situation there was an offer on the table and it was an exactly. uh, offer you liked a lot and it, it sounds great and then um uh it was you know withdrawn which some, sometimes happens. And then uh, you're very often, as I know really well, stuck with uh, yeah something that's uh, not worth so much anymore. So, okay, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, let's see. Um, do you have any uh, other uh, like great energy investments or uh, sh shall we switch to some of your other... Uh, uh, no, right, right now it's just uh, Luke Oil and, oh, and, okay. and as I said in the in the coal space uh, alliance mm -hmm. resource, uh, which which it's is is a great company. I mean, uh, it's it's very it's very hard to find better management than Alliance. It's it's something incredible to be honest. Uh, okay. And then console, which and what which makes them so great? Um, you know, people have different ideas of what makes uh, management great. So I'm always curious. Well, I would say as uh, they are owner operators, which which mm -hmm. I know it's it's a, a a much used catch, but but in this case it's true, right? They they have a substantial uh, part of uh, part of the of their wealth invested in the business, okay? And when you look at, at the historical track record in terms of distributions and and the return on capital employee uh, for such a cyclical business, mm -hmm. such as coal, right? It has been incredible. I I would say that I I've, I've never found. A company better managed the, than, than Alliance uh, when, when you look purely at the numbers, right? They have been able to create a very flexible uh, cost structure. I mean, when you look at their performance during uh, the, the COVID crash, they have been able to, to idle some mines. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been very flexible in cost, and, and so far, in the worst year in the in the history of the of the coal industry, they have been a, they have been able to generate some free cash flow. Of course, because of working capital, and, and you know, there, there are some tricks, right? But 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 but, but even so, it, it has been incredible, right? And 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 now they they are able to, to ramp up production very quickly, right? So this this is a production. I mean, this is a name that that we really like, and that we think that the the bonds maturing in, in 2025 or 2023, I don't remember right now. I mean, they they, they provide a very nice very nice opportunity. Right? They are okay. paying something like a sixteen percent yield or something like that. Wow! Which I so, think is great. and this is another um, company because I mean, you, when you invest in equity, you uh, pick companies without much debt. Uh, does this one, when you go into the debt yourself, do you uh, care about how levered it is, or um, is it less of a concern? No, yes, leverage is always is always a concern. Okay. And, and, um, and especially in coal, where where, where your, your margin of safety is always so always, always small. Okay. okay. In, in this case, both in the case of console and, and alliance, I think we we have found players that they are going to be the last players, the, the survivors. Yeah. Uh, the last tons of coal that are going to produce in the US are going to be by either one of these players. I'm I'm pretty sure about it. Okay. Interesting. Um, 